And I want to start by welcoming everyone that is able to join us today. We're very glad that you're here. Today, we are going to talk about sickle cell disease and school considerations. I am Sarah Decato. I am one of the school nurse specialists that works here with the Maine Department of Education. We will have time for question and answers at the end of this presentation, so you can hold your questions till then. If you want to drop them in the chat as they come to you, you can also do that as well. Uh, we are recording today's presentation, as I mentioned, so if you want to go back and reflect on this uh, webinar afterwards, we can do, you can do that, and we will share it out statewide as well. There will be a certificate link available to everyone in attendance for the live session uh, that I will post in the chat closer to the end of the presentation. And without further ado, I do wanna turn this over to Shannon Cole, our main presenter here today, so that she can introduce herself. Shannon, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Um, this is really exciting for our team because as probably all of you are seeing in the schools, the sickle cell population in Maine is, is growing rapidly. So it's important to get um, information about these kids out. So I'm Shannon Cole, I'm at the Maine Children's Cancer Program. And as we go along in the talk, I'll introduce um, more of our sickle cell team as well. Um, so today in my talk, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about our program, um, if you don't know us already. We're gonna talk about the basics of sickle cell disease complications um, to be looking for in school, in school considerations, what's available for treatment for sickle cell disease, and then also just a few resources. Um, so we're at the Maine Children's Cancer Program. If you don't know us, we are um, oncology and hematology care. Um, we're the outpatient clinic in Scarborough. When our kids need to be hospitalized inpatient, they're at Barbara Bush. Um, and then, you know, this is just a, a letter that we attached from one of our patients during COVID and kind of just speaks a little bit to how connected these kids are to our clinic and how, um, you know, we know them from birth or when, from when they arrive in Maine um, until adulthood. So we just, you know, they, I think the kids love coming to clinic and we love seeing them. Our kids come in to see us about every three months. Um, and the visits, they're essentially well visits for our sickle cell. Um, you know, they what we want to do is bring them in and educate them on um, complications of sickle cell and when they should be notifying us to get treatment. They get an exam. Um, it's important to know their baseline. They always get a spleen exam. So it's important to know what their spleen is like when they're not ill. Education, education. Basically, we are trying to empower our patients to be able to um, take care of their own chronic disease. Um, we also do blood work at each visit. Um, their labs tell us a lot about what's going on with them. And again, it's really important to know what their baseline is. We also have a child life specialist here on our team um, who helps a lot with blood draws um, and just working through having a chronic illness. We also have a music therapist, um, a wonderful addition to our team as well. So just to introduce you to the sickle cell team here at Maine Children's Cancer Program, um, the way that our clinic works is we have a primary team model. So this goes for our oncology population as well. So each team is composed of a social worker, a primary nurse, and the primary physician. Um, and we each have a different day that we see our primary kids on. So this is um, Team Wednesday Sickle Cell. So it's um, Dr. Weiss, myself, and Dee Dee Hogan, um, who's our social worker. And because our um, numbers are growing so much, we now have a second team um, taking patients as well. Um, Dr. Z is the physician who um, may be joining us later for some questions. Emily is another one of our social workers. And then um, Pam Libby um, is another one of our nurses. Hi guys, I'm here. Sorry to join a little. Oh late. hi, hi Say, yay! Thanks for joining. Yeah, I think um a few members of the team will be on at the end. Um, so if you save your question, you know we can all kind of field them. So just to give you an idea of um where we were with our numbers and where we've been um going. So before 2015, which is about the time that I um I started taking care of sickle cell patients here. When I first started, there was a need for um 
a hematology nurse in addition to oncology um, population. So we only had a few patients, so it was kind of no big deal. We had about 14. Well, now we have about 75 patients. Um, we've had approximately 27 new patients since last January. So the numbers are just growing, um, you know, with all the new mainers coming in. And then a lot of our patients um, that we already have are, you know, having siblings. Um, this population, as, as you all probably know out in the schools, they're a vulnerable population, um, not only because of their diagnosis, but because of the many barriers related to language and resources. Um, there, a lot of our patients are younger as well. Um, they, you know, like you can see all the languages here. So we, we need interpreters for our visits. Um, we love to have live interpreters, but we don't always have that. So that's another barrier is having to use an iPad interpreter isn't always the easiest. Um, and then they, a lot of them have transportation needs too. So our social workers are a real important part of this process, um, getting these patients to the clinic and just helping them meet their needs. Um, another thing just to think about with this population too is that you know, they're coming from Africa. It's it, medical treatment was different there for sickle cell disease. Um, a lot of the families have a hard time accepting this diagnosis. Sometimes we meet families um, that didn't know that their child had sickle cell disease and the child might be five years old now and they had been well. So sometimes it's really hard for the families to wrap their head around this, that their child looks well, but they have this diagnosis of sickle cell disease because what they've known of sickle cell disease has looked like bad outcomes. You know, I think um, in Africa, they where they were, they weren't really looking at all the preventative care stuff. We're here, our model is we're trying to prevent what all the, um, the bad outcomes that we know can happen from sickle cell disease. And we do have resources to do that. So sometimes with these families, you know, they may not believe the diagnosis. Um, we are just trying to establish trust and um, teach them the reality that we do have preventative care and that um, their child can have sickle cell disease and be well. Um, so since we've been having this growth at MCCP, we um, have been trying to think about, you know, what, what do we need to do to get the word out that we have all these sickle cell patients and get this community to know how to take care of them. Um, so over the last few years, we've developed some care algorithms that are used in the emergency room so that these kids get a standard of care treatment. Um, they have a high risk diagnosis flag in their chart. Um, we've changed some of the access to their, their care. So previous, we recently just did a project where um, they previously had to have an ultrasound done yearly, and it was done at Maine Med. And a lot of patients were missing their appointments and no showing. And a lot of it had to do with transportation and it was just a different location than where our clinic is. So we've changed the location to that and it's worked out really well. And we've had um, you know, patients actually showing for these really important exams. We've been doing a lot of community outreach. Um, we visited um, you know, St. Mary's. We have a large population in Lewiston. The B Street Clinic takes care of a lot of our patients. So just creating a partnership with everyone in the community that we know is seeing these patients as well. And of course, all of you school nurses are a huge part of that as you're seeing these kids daily. Um, our patients all have a sickle cell care card. We created this a few years ago. Um, this is what it looks like, just a kind of a brief view of it. But the idea is that they have a card in their wallet that identifies them as a patient who has sickle cell disease. So when they get to the emergency room, they should be presenting this card to the emergency room staff so that they're seen quickly and um, the providers know to contact our office because we want them to get you know a certain a certain standard of care. Um, just getting into what sickle cell disease is, um, it's an inherited blood condition, and it's a mutation in the beta globin gene that affects red blood cells. So essentially, what's happening is these um, these cells, they're sickle cells are crescent shaped, they're um, sticky, and they really just clog up the vessels, um, causing a number of problems. Um, there's decreased oxygen flow to, to the organs, which causes a lot of problems as well. Um, and then this is, I don't know if her school nurse is on here, but one of our um, really sweet patients 
and just kind of, I just love this picture because she's so happy and she's um, someone who loves coming to clinic and she's man her sickle cell disease is managed really well. Um, her, her family is very compliant there. They follow all the medications. Um, and it's just nice to know that patients with sickle cell disease can be happy and healthy. They can get sick really quickly too, but, um, you know, this is just, just a view of what they can look like. Um, so here you have, um, the red blood cells and just, you can see the different shapes. Um, you know, a normal red blood cell is round, it's soft, it, it can kind of move throughout the vessels without issues. They sort of bounce off each other. Where the sickle cells, um, as you can see the little crescents in here, they just get clogged up together um, and cause occlusion that then leads to um, lots of different problems. So another issue with the sickle cells is the lifespan is um, about 20 days or less. So that causes the chronic anemia in patients um, where a normal red blood cell lasts about 120 days. So the short lifespan, they're using up their cells quickly. And then particularly if they get sick and their cells are going um, are dying off quickly, then they're not able to compensate and make up um, for the loss and kind of catch up with their hemoglobins. Um, so here you have an, another picture of the cells just kind of going through the vessels and how it happens. Um, you know, along there, along with the sickle type cells, there's also increased inflammation. Um, they tend to have a higher white blood cell count because of the increased inflammation. So the more cells that you have in there, the more things that you have to get sticky and kind of clog things up. For our patients with sickle cell disease. So sickle cell disease is the most common genetic disease in the U.S. Um, generally, we see it in Black or African-American births but there are other um, individuals affected as well. So just important to know that. Um, and as we know, it's a genetic mutation. So um, here's just the quick you know, view to see what it looks like. You have two parents with sickle cell trait um, can have a baby with sickle cell disease. So you might have two people who don't realize that they have sickle cell trait, and then suddenly they have a baby that has um, you know, SS, which is the full on sickle cell disease. Um, also, you know, to think about too, you know, gen genetics is so interesting because we have families that have four children and have three kids affected and one kid not affected or have four children and have only one child affected. Um, so each child, you know, has that, that percentage of a chance of being an SS. Also to know, um, this was a question that came to me. Um, there are definitely different genotypes. It's not always as simple as just the inherited S's, um, but also you don't you don't need to overthink this. Um, generally, most of our patients are SS, um, and the different genotypes don't mean a lot, except that you know there are SS tends to be more severe. S beta zero is also severe. Um, essentially, they have no, they don't have any regular hemoglobin A. Um, SC is another type that we see that is a little bit milder as well as um, S beta positive. So you probably all have heard of a newborn screen. Um, this is generally how our patients do get to us. Um, the newborn screens happen in all, uh, all US states. Um, and it's basically just a blood draw that's done you know, before the infant is discharged from the hospital. Um, and when a patient has a positive sickle screen on their newborn screen, we'll get the, the newborn screen for a patient that was born in Maine. Um, and then the process goes that we contact the PCP. Um, and the, per the main purpose of this newborn screen is early intervention. Um, we want to initiate penicillin because these patients, um, their spleen just doesn't work the same way. Um, so we want to protect them with penicillin. Um, we also see patients when they're new mainers. So the new mainers get to us generally by re a referral from the PCP. So the PCP will have um, screened them and they'll send them our way. Um, and then also we have patients that just present, maybe they're a new mainer, they just present to the local ER in crisis. And that's how we hear about them. And then we get them into our clinic 
and um, start following them. All right, I'm just gonna get into now sickle cell complications. Um, there are many. The ones that you probably hear about most often are um, pain, fever and infection, acute chest syndrome, stroke, um, aplastic crisis, lymphatic sequestration, priapism, and then we also should think about vision opto issues. Those are the ones I'm gonna really focus on because um, I felt like those are the ones that you're most likely to see signs and symptoms of at school. Um, but as you can see from this picture here, essentially every part of the body is affected from sickle cell disease because of the decreased um, oxygen that gets distributed throughout the body. So any any part of your body, any organ, that needs blood and oxygen, you know, is, is getting less than they should be. So vasoocclusive crisis. Um, so pain um, is caused by sickle cells becoming trapped and getting clogged up in those vessels. Um, and it's interfering with the normal blood flow and causes intense, serious pain for these patients. It can occur anywhere. Um, we often see it in the back or extremities. And with pain, it's just so important to know that these patients experience real pain. Um, they don't always they don't always act like they're in intense pain. You know, some some of these patients, their baseline threshold for pain is is very high. Um, so you may not know how much pain they're really in, and it's really all about um, self reporting. Um, there is really no reliable way for us to measure pain with labs. Um, so again, we just, you know, these patients, we know that sickle cell causes um, extreme pain and it's important to, um, you know, listen to patients as they're reporting that. So the management of uh, VOC, fluids, fluids are really important in sickle cell disease. Um, you know, when a, when a patient starts feeling a, a pain crisis come on, and it's mild and they call us, we're telling them to hydrate, to be drinking a lot of fluids. Um, to rest, warmth is great. Um, you never want to do cold, even when, um, even even if like you have like a sports injury, you don't want to put ice on them, um, you know, because you want to be warming them up and not having those vessels um, constrict. Um, so for pain medications, we start with ibuprofen for mild pain, um, and then oxycodone. A lot of our patients. Um, actually don't even have oxycodone at home. Um, you know, we kind of, we do, we do kind of um, monitor the patients. If they're not, we used to prescribe oxycodone to all of our sickle cell patients. And then a lot of them were not needing it. You know, they were being controlled with ibuprofen. So we sort of just measure it, you know, if they are starting to have more pain at home and could benefit from, from oxycodone, we do add that into their um, home prescriptions. Um, but there are, again, some that do need it more often. If after um, oxycodone, patients are still having pain, they likely will need an ER evaluation. We do try to manage um, pain at home as much as possible by early detection and, and, and intervention and getting right in there. Um, but if, you know, if, it's, if the pain is, is out of control, they really will need to go to the ER. Um, with ibuprofen also, you know, it's really important for our patients we're always telling them that if um, if they're taking oxycodone, they should also be taking ibuprofen as well. Ibuprofen has the anti-inflammatory properties and, you know, like sickle cell does have the inflammation um, with it as well. So they should be taking both of those. So in school, um, you know, for prevention, you can think about avoiding cold, thinking about um, your patients and how they're getting to school um, in the winter for transportation. Um, and then also, you know, in the summertime, or as things get warmer too, heat, um, you know, the extreme heat can cause dehydration and crisis as well. Um, we really do want our patients to participate in outdoor recess. That's, I think that is probably one of the number one questions that I get from schools is, are um, the students allowed to go outside? And yes, we want them outside. We want them outside with their classmates. Um, but the most important thing is to really make sure they're properly bundled. And that's also something that we do talk to our families about as well. But certainly if you have um, a child that has sickle cell disease and they're not coming into school, 
with the proper clothing and you have questions about it and about getting them outside, please reach out to us. Um, and, you know, as, as a guideline, we've been um, using the feels like temperature less than 20 to keep them inside. And my understanding of that is that is um, pretty much the guidelines that most schools do use anyways for, for all the children. So, um, you know, we kind of just try and keep them together with everyone. Um, and if they do have to stay inside, you know, we do ask that they have an alternative activity um, plan for them as well. Um, so again, for the pain medications, I did talk about this a little bit already, but ibuprofen is always your first line for mild pain and then adding in oxycodone as needed. <laughs> um, oxycodone is always a tricky one. You know, I think that there's a lot of fear out there about overuse and misuse of oxycodone. Um, so it, as far as from a sickle cell perspective, um, oxycodone is an excellent drug for our patients because we know they experience real pain. So it's important for us to encourage our families to use the oxycodone when their child is in pain. <laughs> that being said, um, you know, we do, we are monitoring the use of oxycodone. And if we're starting to see that um, patients are, if we're starting to see that patients are going through a lot of oxycodone, um, you know, then we are thinking about other ways to control their pain. Um, if they're having frequent pain crisis or they're in the hospital a lot, you know, we might be thinking about blood transfusions. Is there a room for increase in their hydroxyurea <clears throat> or other new therapies? Um, we do also have a PAP team that they're an excellent resource to us um, that we consult with a lot if we're seeing patients that are using a lot of oxycodone. <laughs> um, infection and sickle cell disease. So um, we know that patients with sickle cell disease are at an increased re risk of infection because of their spleen. Their spleens don't function properly. 90% um, of infants have lost their splenic function by the time that they're two years old. So they're at high risk for the pneumococcal infection. Patients are on um, penicillin until they're five because we know of this risk. Um, so again, that's part of the newborn screening process is to get those patients early on penicillin. So fever in sickle cell patients, um, we think of a fever for them as 101 degrees or higher. It's an emergency in this patient population. Um, we don't want to delay treatment. We want them to get to the emergency room. We do tell them to call our clinic so that we can call ahead for them and also just so that we know that they're there and we can help manage the care. I will say that doesn't always happen and the main priority is just getting them to the emergency room for treatment. Um, it doesn't happen because of the language barrier. Um, and then when they get to the emergency room, the workup is labs, blood cultures, IV antibiotics, and they might be admitted pending um, what's going on with them. So for school considerations, um, you know, contact the family immediately it, and do not give ibuprofen or Tylenol. That's um, a huge teaching point for our families is that when their child has a fever, they should not be giving ibuprofen or Tylenol. They should be getting them to the emergency room. And it happens over and over again that patients are given ibuprofen. Maybe we hear about it two days later. Um, but, you know, we talk about it in every visit, just fever, get to the emergency room for treatment. Um, in school, you know, if the parents, the parents should be able to get there and get them to the emergency room. But if they, if they can't get there quickly, you may have to consider, you know, other modes of transportation if they, um, it is an emergency. So an ambulance would be appropriate if a parent can't get there for say, you know, an hour or so. <clears throat> Acute chest syndrome. So acute chest syndrome is basically a pneumonia in a patient with sickle cell disease. Um, you know, the difference is our patients with sickle cell disease can't compensate the same way um, as a patient that has normal blood flow and normal oxygen thro flowing throughout them. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a pulmonary infiltrate on a chest x-ray plus a fever or a change in respiratory status. So you're gonna be looking for a chest pain that might spread down to their belly, um, fever, cough, 
increased respiratory rate or shortness of breath, congestion, um, and they'll need evaluation. So, you know, this is, you know, they might have a mild cough, but you're looking for a little bit more than that. Um, or if they do have like an ongoing cough um, that they can't seem to shake, I think that would be, um, that that would validate a um, evaluation as well. So for acute chest syndrome, um, they likely will have a hospital admit um, and their treatment will be antibiotic therapy and supportive care, it might be oxygen. Um, it, we do often see patients with acute chest syndrome have um, a trip to pick you too. I mean, it, it does get very serious. So stroke is a risk of sickle cell disease, or sorry, sickle, <laughs> stroke is a risk for sickle cell disease. Um, so individuals with sickle cell disease, they're at a high risk of stroke. Um, about 8 to 10% of children with sickle cell disease will have a stroke. And one of the things that we do um, as part of our preventative care is the transcranial Doppler ultrasound. And this, um, this measures their risk for stroke, and then we can put some preventative care in place um, to try and prevent a stroke. Um, and then that's just a picture of the, of the testing that we do. It's um, pretty non-invasive and it's done yearly. As far as looking for a stroke, um, you're thinking about any kind of neurotype symptom besides a mild headache. Um, you know, and you can think about the similar approach to adults using the FAST acronym, the face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. Um, headaches can be a sign as well. Um, you know, a headache that maybe doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have any relief after a little Tylenol or ibuprofen. But the rule of thumb is that any new um, neuro type symptom does require an urgent evaluation. School considerations with stroke. Um, and I will tell you that we do, um, we do have a patient who recently had a stroke and um, her school nurse and I are learning about, you know, all the things that need to be in place to get her um, back to school. So it does get pretty complicated. Um, so they, so a, a child who's um, had a stroke or has been identified as high risk, and that would be based on the transcranial Doppler ultrasound that we do yearly. Um, one of the treatments that we do is a monthly blood transfusion. So, I mean, that would be one day a month that they're not in school. So just thinking about the school absence. Um, and then also just thinking about neurocognitive defects for these patients. Um, whether we know that they had a stroke or not, there's um, a lot of patients, I believe it's about 22% of patients that have SS disease may have had a silent stroke that we don't even know about. So it's just really important to consider learning needs and neuropsych testing for all children with sickle cell disease. As I mentioned, um, patients with sickle cell disease do have a chronic anemia, just base, baseline um, for their disease. Um, and it's because of that short life of the sickle cells. They, um, they might tire with activity. So just knowing their baseline. And most of these kids do know their baseline and generally want to um, be involved and jump in to do things. Um, but also just having um, on hand maybe a, a alternative way for patients or for um, students to participate. So aplastic crisis, um, with the, them already having a baseline anemia, um, aplastic crisis is a real risk for them. Um, you know, and, and a couple ways that we see it are splenic sequestration, which is a condition where um, the blood goes into the spleen but gets trapped in and doesn't come out. So everything's getting kind of clogged up in there, causing anemia and sometimes a thrombocytopenia. Um, it, and it can be fatal. It happens quick and it can be fatal. So, um, you know, a patient that is um, feeling really fatigued, there's a change in their activity, they have a, a, a big belly, um, large spleen would be, a, you know, an indicator and a real concern for that. Um, and then also infection, um, parvovirus can, ca can pause the red cell production and then cause a rapid decrease in hemoglobin. And again, these patients with that, their um, lifespan of their red cells being so much shorter, they're not making up for, they're not making up as quickly for um, the decreased production. Um, and we actually, do, we did just have a patient who, some of these, this I'm always learning, you know, with these, our sickle cell patients, 
you know, patients that you've known for years and they've always been well and they've always had, you know, an okay baseline hemoglobin. And then suddenly, you know, we had a girl who had a hemoglobin of 4.9 and she had been, she had been ill and that's, you know, and that's really what we think happened. Um, and in those cases, what we do is we just support them with transfusions as needed until they can um, get back to um, their baseline. So things that you might be looking for in these situations are the extreme fatigue, shortness of breath, um, when walking the stairs, that is uh, that is one thing that the this particular um, student had reported is that she didn't wanna go to school because she um, was feeling too tired to walk up the stairs, which was extremely unusual for her. Um, so it was a big indicator that there was something going on. And then sure enough, we checked labs and you know her hemoglobin was 4.9 and she normally runs a baseline of eight to nine. So you're just thinking about those um, anemia type symptoms, headache, dizziness. Um, you might see some jaundice because it's like that breakdown of cells. Um, and our sickle cell patients at baseline might have, um, you know, might might have a little bit of yelling in the eyes um, just because this their cells, the hemolysis and the breakdown of cells. So priapism um, occurs in males with sickle cell disease, and what it is is it's a state, sustained, painful, and unwanted erection. Um, you treat this like a pain crisis with supportive care. Um, I think there's a lack of awareness about this sickle cell-related complication, and you know, obviously, this can be really embarrassing and difficult um, for for a student to bring up. But um, just know, you know, if this does happen, it is a it's a very normal and seeing complication of sickle cell disease. Um, you know, you wanna increase fluids, um, have them urinate, treat them with oral pain medications because it can be really painful. Um, warm bath, exercise, you know, and certainly if in a school situation, this, they would probably, um, you know, call to the parent to pick up. Um, but if it's lasting two hours or more, it needs evaluation um, and they would be seen by urology in the emergency room to try and, <laughs> Um, try and try and fix that. Um, vision changes are something to think about in our sickle cell population as well. <laughs> um, these patients are at risk for sickle cell related retinopathies. And they get a yearly evaluation by OPTHO as part of our like preventative exams. Um, we start this at school age. So just thinking about any changes in vision, um, that, that you know, we should know about as well. Um, dehydration, um, it's important to be thinking about dehydration in patients with sickle cell disease. So um, if you have a patient who has vomiting and diarrhea, they really need to be monitored closely for dehydration just because of the, um, you know, the, the dehydration really can affect a um, crisis. These patients may have increased urination, bedwetting, increased thirst, dehydration. Um, they have difficulty concentrating their urine as well, so um, just more frequent urination. In school, you want to think about them having unlimited access to the bathroom and then also water available for dehydration. And um, I did already mention about the increased need for fluids and heat or with exercise as well. So medications for these patients, um, hydroxyria. Um, hydroxyria is our best treatment that we have for sickle cell disease. Folic acid, um, which aids in red cell production. Ibuprofen and oxycodone um, for pain management. And as I said, not all of these patients do have oxycodone at home, um, but they really should all have ibuprofen. And, you know, our, it kind of varies with um, the oxycodone use with our patients. There are some that don't use it, and then there are some that do need it frequently. So, um, you know, I think it's individualized for each patient. And, you know, I'm not sure. I think it all, probably all depends on school policies. If, um, you know, if, if the school is comfortable having a patient after they have had oxycodone um, at school. Um, but I do think it it is um, reasonable that if a patient that has more frequent pain crisis, if they're able to stay in school after a dose of oxycodone, and they're feeling better. Um, obviously, it's up to you know your guidelines, but I do think that that's reasonable if um, they get some relief from that. 
And then penicillin um, for our patients under the age of five for um, prevention of infection. So hydroxyurea is the first effective drug treatment for sickle cell disease that was um, FDA approved in 1998. And what it does is it increases the production of fetal hemoglobin, which is essentially like a baby hemoglobin. So then they have more normal hemoglobin circulating in their, um, in their blood flow and then less S cells. Um, also, um, the, the hydroxyurea will decrease the white, white blood cell count and platelet count. So then it, that's a good thing because then um, there's less cells also circulating around to get stuck and kind of clogged up. We do, um, we do start the dosing around 20 mg per kilo, but the goal is to get them to their max tolerated dose. So we're kind of looking for that sweet spot, which is why we're always doing labs at their visit. So we're looking for them to get maximum benefit um, on the highest possible dose of hydroxyurea. But then we also don't want that to give them too much that then they get um, you know, a really low white count or they their platelets are too low. So we have these thresholds that we're constantly looking at and um, increasing the dosing when possible. <clears throat> um, it's really well tolerated. And the, big issue, the biggest issue is patients not taking it. Um, and that's where, um, you know, lately I've been leaning a little bit on a few of the school nurses and it has come up as a good idea, you know, to, if they can take their, their hydroxyurea at school, if it's not getting taken at home, if they could take it at school, then they're at least getting it five days a week. Um, so, so this is a medication that you may hear from me or the parents asking if you would help to administer it. It's available in pill form and then can be made into a liquid compound. There are some um, new therapies for sickle cell disease. Um, not really going to get too far into them, but just something to think about that there are some other things out there. Um, and there is also curative therapies. Um, stem cell transplant is a cure for sickle cell disease. It certainly has its, a lot of risks and really is reserved for just the patients with, um, with a really great match and patients that are having a lot of complications, um, you know, that they're not having quality of life. Um, that you could really, you know, weigh that benefit risk and say that the stem cell transplant was the way to go. Gene therapy is coming down the line, um, and there's there's it's trials right now, and there's more to come. But you know, there could be some exciting um, things for sickle cell disease with gene therapy. Um, so that's kind of my overview. Um, but some take home points for school management is. Um, Fever is a medical emergency, and we want those kids treated right away. They need to be seen in the emergency room. Um, hydration is huge and bathroom breaks. Being aware of temperature, whether it's really cold or really hot. Think about, um, you know, air conditioning in the classrooms, open windows, um, being properly bundled to get outside. Expect school absences and work with the students for catch-up. Um, at minimum, you know, they're coming to see us every three months and doing a couple um, yearly evaluations with other services. So, you know, just at least for appointments at the very least. Um, encourage the patients to do physical activity, but also allow rest if needed. Um, and being aware of the child's baseline. You, I think the school nurses are in a position to really to really see these kids daily and know what their baseline is and, and know when they're off. Um, so, you know, reach out anytime if you're noticing changes that you're concerned about. We do um, and can do a school letter if needed. Um, and in fact, we've been trying to get out more school letters um, just so that everyone knows sort of what um, what we're looking for. And then also if there's anything specific about that patient to know about um, pain management, um, just really keeping in touch with the families and and. Um, and early intervention with the with the pain management, getting it treated quickly. And then, um, you know, just know that we're here and that we're happy to hear from you, even if it's a question or, um, you know, if it's a change that you just want to run by us, we're always happy to talk. Um, I did want to just share this website. Um, it's, it's a really great resource. It's a group that we're part of um, and just it has guidelines. Let me see if I can pull it up. Um, Oops, 
Oh, okay. I don't know if I can get it. Um, but it's just, it's, it's a good one to kind of have in your back pocket. If um, you had a quick question that you just wanted to look up, there's also some school resources on that website as well. So I can share that. And here's a, one of our families. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I believe um, Dr. Z is, is on the call and I'm not sure if Dr. Weiss still is or not, but um, we also have, if Jay is still here too, um, I know I really didn't talk much about school plans. I'm kind of your go-to for any sickle cell related questions, but we do, Jay Westra is our um, education liaison for um for Maine Children's Cancer Program, so our oncology population. Um, so if you have questions, you know, about different plans or whatever, he might be able to help answer those. Um, yeah, so I can open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was wonderful. <laughs> Excuse me. I do have a few questions in the chat that I just want to make sure um, you're able to answer members of your team. And one was came up when you were talking about um, ibuprofen um, as the first line of defense. And I heard a couple of different things that I just wanna make sure we have clarity on. So uh, you talked about ibuprofen and fever, and then you also talked about ibuprofen and headache. Can you talk mm -hmm. about those two pieces and then I'll go on to the next question. Um, yes, so let's see. So for fevers, do not give ibuprofen. Um, so we we like to reserve, we don't wanna mask the fever. So if a patient has a fever, we should hear from, we should hear from a patient. Um, and we would direct them to the emergency room. Um, and for headache, it is you can treat you can treat headache pain with ibuprofen. But if it's a headache um, and a severe headache, we should hear about that. And if it's if there's no relief after ibuprofen, we should hear about that as well, just to decide if if further evaluation is needed. Is that kind of what you were thinking about? Um, this is, yeah, this is, uh, I think if the person um, that asked the question has additional questions, please feel free to um, to ask them. This is an additional question here that goes along with that. I know you said that um, it's so not to mask anything when in regards to fever. And the question here is, if there's any additional information, is the reason you ask parents not to give ibuprofen or Tylenol for fever, is it to encourage transport to the ER without delay or does it have negative side effects when the, the fever is present? No, so when, when they get to the emergency room, we let them have ibuprofen. It's just that we don't want, we don't want them to, to um, take the ibuprofen at home and then think, oh, the fever's gone. We don't need to call. We don't need to go to the emergency room. It's all about the masking of it. Um, so we would prefer to give the ibuprofen when they get to the emergency room. And sometimes it is a little bit tricky too. Um, you know, because oftentimes you'll have pain and fever that kind of can go together a little bit. Um, so, I mean, that is a fine line. Like if, if, a, if a patient hasn't really met the criteria for a fever, say they're at 100.5 for 100, I still wouldn't give them ibuprofen because that's probably going to declare itself. Great. Thank you. And then um, this is uh, a comment about 504s. It was really helpful to develop 504 plans and offer tutoring on a regular basis for students with sickle cell that were missing school routinely because of their disease. So just a, a comment um, about the 504 plans. And then I did post the link that you shared so that people could have it here. Um, still have time for questions, but I want to um, ask everybody here that's a school nurse, if you haven't already filled out the form that I posted in the chat, please do that. I'm also going to post here momentarily um, the certificate for contact hours so that um, you have that as well. But other yeah. questions, feel free to ask them or put them in the chat. Yeah, and um, say, I don't know if you have anything you want to add or Jay, please jump in if there's anything that we, you feel like we can expand upon? Um, no, I mean, I, I think you did a great job <laughs> and you like covered a lot of ground, which is really wonderful. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to echo that we're always here and always happy and kind of want to hear if, if things are going on for our patients, just so we can kind of stay in the loop and um, help provide guidance if that's helpful. Thank you so much. Hi, Maria. Hi. Hi, guys. I miss you all. Um, I just wanted to say that, uh, so I work at a school um, and getting the letter 
from you guys was actually kind of what prompted everything for us. Um, I, I'm I'm kind of concerned that there could be other students in my school that have sickle cell that I just don't know about. Um, mm. But I assume you guys encouraged them to tell the school nurses. Yeah, and that's yeah. actually we um, yeah. the summer, like in the summer, kind of leading up to the school year, we try to check in to make sure we have like updated contact, like, you know, know what school they're going to be at and um, get their permission to reach out. OK, yeah, because I have a third grader. And honestly, this this is the first year that we've put a plan in place. Um, So I'm just like happy that that letter came because I don't mm -hmm. know that we would it would have happened if we didn't get that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will say we've had a little bit more of an effort to um, to ask the families where they're going to school and would they like us to send a letter. And most of them do say yes. Um, you know, occasionally there'll be one that'll be like, no. <laughs> um, but we, you know, that's a good point to like really prompt them, like how important it is for the school nurses to know. Yeah. They have yeah. Disease. yeah. Cause it's like I said, he's in third grade. So <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What school are you at? Sakurapa in Westbrook. In Westbrook. Oh, okay. Westbrook. All right. Great question. Awesome. Thank a, you. This has been great. I have Thank another, you. another question here. Um, as a school nurse, how can I persuade my parent to seek medical evaluation for a fever? I have a parent that doesn't understand the risk. He doesn't want to pick his student up from school at all. Do you have any pointers or words of advice um, that you could share with us? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. It kind of goes back to that whole thing of like, sometimes these families don't want, um, yeah, they, they don't want to seek care and they don't really, they think their child is well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just like reinforcing like how important it is and the risk of infection is huge. And, um, yeah. And I think also in, in your case as a school nurse too, I think that probably, you would unfortunately have to say that if they can't come pick them up, like you know that the direction is to, you know, get them to the emergency room to be treated, that they'll have to go by ambulance. Um, yeah. What and then we have, we, have, we have a question. Oh, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Oh, no, I just, I, I, um, I, I struggled with that too. I think we certainly all, all have seen those families who have, um, have been more resistant to care. And I think that can be multifactorial. And I, I do wonder sometimes about like, you know, how easy is it for the parent to come? You know, transportation is always um, a common issue for um, for many of our families. And so um, I think troubleshooting around that. Yeah, we, potentially we did have a patient that, that um, I remember the family was really concerned <clears throat> about insurance um, and getting a bill from the hospital. So I don't know yet, like maybe just like kind of sorting out what, what the barrier is and how can we help them? Any suggestions. Um, and then we have a question, can we contact you for letters if we haven't received anything from the parents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yes, definitely. Obviously we'll have to in some form get a consent um, from the families, but yes, please do. And did you have a slide there, Shannon, with your contact information, or do you want to drop it in uh, the chat? Yeah, why don't I drop it in the chat? That would be great. The best way probably is really just to call our clinic. Um, and I am here most days, but if I don't get back to you that same day, it'll be within a day or two. Great. Thank you. And I have dropped the certificate of attendance in the chat. I have dropped the data form for school nurses in attendance. Um, are there any additional questions that people have before we sign off for today? Um, I just saw another question that popped in about um, for fever evaluations, do they have to go to the ER or could they go to the convenient MD for a free or reduced visit? Um, I have found, I don't know what your experience has been, Shannon, is that um, a lot of the local urgent cares, if they are aware of a diagnosis of sickle cell, they often I recommend that families go to the um to the ER um just because of the potential complexities of of management. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I don't think the convenient MD would be able to do the IV antibiotics because that's a big part of it. Yeah. Is getting you know, it's really important to see that what their labs are and then um, blood filters and the antibiotics, so they just wouldn't get the same level of care. 
There's been a rare occasion where I think PD clinic has done a fever visit for us before. It hasn't happened in a long time, I think with COVID and all that. But if they present there, I think that there's been a, you know, once or twice that that's happened. We have another question too. Uh, somebody mentioned, yeah, it can be an, can be an MD or similar. Doesn't normally have stat labs generally. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a question. I'm curious if any schools allow children to be present if prescription pain meds are required. I'm curious about that too. So, <laughs> so if anyone has any intel on that, I'd love to know. Anybody um, wants yeah. to respond to? Yeah, and I do think, you know, it, I, it's not going to be for the kid that um, doesn't often take oxycodone, you know, like it would be, I think it would be um, a child that has more frequent pain crisis and they're needing more oxycodone. Um, it, this is, if, if it's a patient that, you know, needs it occasionally, that wouldn't make sense. But I think it's reasonable for a child that would be missing a lot of school because of, um, oxycodone use. And there's two two people did chime in to share their experience. It's based on what their local school board decides, their local school board policy. Um, prescription pain meds could possibly also be covered in a 504 plan. And Jay mentions we've had oncology patients at school with oxycodone before. Mm -hmm. All great information. Yeah, and we can also, you know, like if, if you are finding that you have a patient who's missing a lot of school, Chances are we probably know about it because they're probably in the hospital, but please reach out to us so that, you know, if there is a way to get them back to school um, and it involves oxycodone, maybe we can just work together on that on an individual basis. Great. Thank you so much. We so appreciate you all being here. And I just wanted to add one last thing. Emily chimed in and just said school board policies could be changed if needed with additional education for the reasons it might be needed. So everybody should keep that in mind too. If you don't have a policy that supports such, um, there's always the opportunity to adjust a policy accordingly. So thank you so much, Shannon, and the rest of the team here at Health. We really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge with us. It's been a lot of feedback about how positive uh, the information sharing has been. Um, and those of you on the call, please don't hesitate to reach out to this team should you have additional questions. We appreciate you being here. So thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope to hear from you guys.